Presenting your best self online is about designing your online persona and presence. There's so many tools at our disposal when using online video conferencing, but are we using them effectively? And are we making the simple choices about our environment, our lighting, and our wardrobe that's gonna make our message stand out? Today, we're going to talk about how others see us when we present online and become more actualized so that we can make effective choices that enhance our online presence so we can present our best self online. My name is Professor Seth C. Orenberg, and I teach contracts, corporations, and venture capital law at Duquesne University School of Law. I got my JD in 2011 from the University of Chicago, and after that I practiced for a short time in Silicon Valley before entering the academy. And for several years I've been teaching online. I recently got certified in online teaching, and I'm looking forward to bringing what I learned about that environment to help you present your best self online in your high value presentations. As I said at the outset, this is really about taking a look through that looking glass of virtual meetings. It turns out that the way we look on the other end of a camera is not necessarily how we expect to be perceived or how we want to be perceived. So today we're gonna to open our eyes, so to speak, to see how others see us and make more deliberate choices about our online persona. We have to perform online more and more these days and as COVID continues, we're finding that meetings are happening online. Interviews, it seems, are going to happen this year online. Uh, we're attending many webinars online and the rules of each are a bit different. When meeting online, you're playing a bit of Hollywood squares in the sense that you're just a box on the screen and you need to be attentive, uh, confident, and seeming professional, but for the most part, so long as you don't say anything too boneheaded, uh, you can kind of skate by and may not even have a lot of attention drawn to you. But once we start turning the spotlight on you, and interviewing online becomes the focal point, uh, we need to really ratchet up our online presence. We need to now bring out that energy, come across as confident, knowledgeable, positive, well-spoken. And we wanna use all the tools in our digital arsenal to convey these subtle clues that tell the hiring committee we are the candidate who is going to bring their uh, institution to the next level. So how are we going to, to do that? Well, we're going to develop uh, what I'll refer to very briefly and technically and then move away from the technical terms as self-perception, uh, which is how you see yourself, and empathetic perception, how others see you. And you can then take action to align your self-perception with your empathetic perception and tailor your best self for a given situation. There are a couple rules of thumb but on top of that, there are a lot of things to think about so you can make the right choice for you. Oh, and this being a webinar, you can just chill. Uh, we got this. Feel free to ask your questions at the end, or you can go ahead and queue those up now in chat. And as we're going through this webinar, if you would like to uh, have me address your questions, I will get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but again, you can chat those now if you just want to get them out there so they can be addressed. That said, let's dive in with what I call five dimensions of online presence. These are five categories or topic areas that really matter and should be thought about when we are uh, creating an online persona and, and engaging in that high value online presentation. They are hardware, which includes things like your computer, your webcam, your microphone, your lighting, potentially a green screen, your software, which in most cases will be the latest version of Zoom, but some institutions prefer GoToMeeting, WebEx, or Microsoft Teams. Your wardrobe, we have to make some different choices about what we wear in terms of colors, fabrics, and accessories. Our setting, which is the environment that we are in, usually these days a home office, but it could be a kitchen table or even a converted attic for some folks, a basement. And finally, your setup, how can you 
uh, create your on-screen visualizations so that you're going to be effective and focused and have your concentration in the right places. Now, I will say at the outset, some of these things might seem trivial, but these things actually matter a great deal. The quality of the color of your light bulb can make a bigger impact than the nature of your degree in these settings. And since everyone has a different level of comfort with this, I'll be addressing some things which are basic to some of you, but advanced to others. I hope there'll be something in this for everyone. And again, I'll take questions at the end to make sure we get all of your personal concerns addressed. If you don't have a webcam, I would advise getting one because on the hardware hierarchy, webcams are going to be your best bet for looking good in an online presentation. Your laptop probably has a built-in camera, but as you'll learn through the course of this presentation, that may not be your best choice in terms of looking good online because a laptop cannot be moved around and placed as easily as a webcam. If you have questions about which webcam to get or how to operate certain features, I can take those in the Q&A as well. I'll also point out, however, that if you have a tablet or a decent smartphone, you might be able to participate on Zoom using one of these devices and actually look better than you could on your laptop, especially if you have a, <clears throat> um, a tripod or some other means of raising that tablet or your phone to the right level. And in that way, it can effectively duplicate the purpose of a webcam. And quick side note, there was just an update on Mac. If you have the latest version of Mac operating system and you have a more recent iPad, you can use your iPad as a separate screen or use its recording and the devices actually talk to each other. So for those of you who are thinking, I can't get a webcam, they're all sold out. There are some alternatives. Um, now, if you, can't, uh, if you can't get actually a webcam or can't use any of these devices, we'll talk a little bit about how to make a tablet work, uh, sorry, how to make a laptop work. But again, we're gonna have some trouble doing that because of getting the camera height right. I'm not gonna say too much about software because you won't get to make software choices, but the market is pretty fragmented. I have a pie chart up here to show you just how many different services and no one is currently leading the market. Most academic institutions are using Zoom, but many are still on GoToMeeting, which is connected to GoToWebinar, and Microsoft Teams is emerging. A lot of companies are now using the free Google product, as well as individuals who are using the Google product. So what's the moral of the story? The moral is you need to be flexible. You need to be prepared to adapt to whatever environment you might have to be on. So. I would recommend finding out as early as possible in the interview process what software you are going to interview on. Download the application to that software. Don't just go to the web page through the link and use the web version. I want you to download that software onto your hard drive, create an account, and run a practice session. You only have so many chances in life to knock it out of the park in an interview and you don't want to be fumbling for the mute button because you're not familiar with the software. Again, you can access all of these softwares through a web portal, but you'll have much less control over your environment and you won't be able to set up your desktop the way I'm going to recommend. So whatever software you need to use, please download that application at least two days before your interview, install it, test it, and then you can you know, familiarize yourself with the key features that you'll need. We're going to focus now on wardrobe because some of the choices you'll make on Zoom are different than the choices that you would make in real life. There are some general caveats which are probably obvious, but one is that you need to look professional. Now, what that means is different for different people. But effectively, you're gonna to wanna to dress very similar to how you would in terms of your interview, at least in terms of level of style. So that may involve, for men, a jacket and a tie. But the way you might choose the color of that jacket and tie uh, is going to be different on Zoom because on Zoom, we want to avoid contrast. Contrast, the difference between light and dark, the level of that difference 
is very important for getting zoom right. Your webcam is not as capable as the human eye or even a good camcorder at having what we call dynamic range, about being able to see a wide variety of things at once. And so if you're looking with a webcam at something that's quite dark, anything that's bright in the picture will be blown out and not visible. Or if the cameras focus on something light, the things that are dark will shade almost entirely to black and be invisible. As a result, we're gonna to work today on thinking about contrast and avoiding high contrast clothing so that we can appear as attractive and as visible as possible on Zoom. And last but not least, keep it neutral. And I don't just mean not having an offensive t-shirt that's put there as a bit of a joke, but think about your environment and think about having a truly neutral environment. So if you're recording from your office, Maybe you're reading a book right now that's somewhat contentious or political. We're coming up against an election, so maybe you're interested in learning more about a candidate. I'd recommend really doing a clean sweep, scrubbing your office, looking through that webcam to make sure that nothing in the camera could potentially distract or disturb any of your viewers. There's no reason to come across as anything but neutral in your environment because the focus should be on what you're saying and your qualifications for this position. Now that said, let me tell you a little story about the shirt that changed the world. It was September 26, 1960, and it was probably the day on which John F. Kennedy stole the presidency from the incumbent president, uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon. In the hours before the debate, Nixon's handlers insisted that he have the backdrop painted because he was having too much contrast between his shirt and the backdrop. But each time they painted it, you know, paint is lighter when it's wet, the backdrop actually grew lighter. Making matters worse, his five o'clock shadow, which was one of his characteristics, looked terrible under these bright lights. So they applied this product called Lazy Shave, which actually melted, didn't look so hot. Kennedy, on the other hand, had worn a darker suit, and moreover, he sent his campaign aide, Dave Powers, back to the hotel room he was staying at to grab a darker blue shirt and a longer pair of socks for him to wear on stage. He determined that that blue shirt was going to give him better contrast, less contrast. Uh, and in addition, he'd actually spent that day sun tanning, so he had darker skin than usual, maybe motivating him to choose that darker shirt. This was one of the first ever televised presidential debates. It was still the early days of television. It's basically the dark ages, or at least the black and white ages. The debate was broadcast in black and white, and Nixon looked terrible. Sick, pale, anxious. Meanwhile, Kennedy came across as confident, polished, and eloquent. This blue shirt played a starring role in Kennedy's televised success and surely made some contribution to changing the course of history. The moral of the story is sometimes on-camera appearance matters. Let me show you an example of how contrast can impact how you appear through that looking glass of virtual conferencing. Webcams are kind of like old TV cameras. They typically bump up contrast, which can wash out light colors and remove content from shadows, making them appear uh, muddy black. What you wear will affect your color and your overall image on the camera. Clothes can wreak havoc on your webcam. So take a look at these images, same day, same environment, same person, within a few minutes of each other. On the picture on the left with a high contrast, I have a, it's actually a blue shirt. It looks white because it's such a light blue shirt. And you can probably tell, you can't tell any of the definition of the wrinkles or the fabric. It's totally blown out. And my face looks kind of reddish and in my mind, kind of unpleasant. Not how I want to appear online. On the other hand, simply putting on a darker shirt not only made the short shirt more visible, but also made my face look a more normal color and at least in my opinion, drew the attention away from the brightness of the shirt toward my eyes. And the eyes, as we'll hear a few times today, are the window to the soul. We want to connect with our audience using eye contact. So you should think about the color of your shirt and how much it will affect you. But again, avoid high contrast between your skin tone 
and your shirt, which means that if you, like me, have a dark beard, or if you have a darker skin color, you might wanna choose a darker shirt to avoid that contrast issue. My wife was kind enough to help me by taking some photos that I could use in this presentation. So a little shout out to Talia here. Thank you for uh, posing for these. My wife likes to wear a wrap because she sometimes gets cold. And one idea she had was, can I just put a wrap on to avoid this color issue? And the answer is yes and no. Having the wrap added does in fact change the overall color temperature and you can see a subtle difference, but since it doesn't actually reach the point where her shirt touches her skin or, or abuts her skin, we still have some contrast issue. It's not as bad as the picture on the left, but the issue that I found when she put on a pashmina or a, or a wrap was that she would fiddle with it and that fiddling was very distracting. I think you should keep it simple to the extent that you're going to be distracted by anything you're wearing and for that matter distracting whoever's watching you by tugging at it or fussing with it, it may be a bad choice for a high value interview. That said, you can use very, very straightforward accessories to change the overall color and for that matter you should obviously want to be comfortable so if you need a sweater to wear that's fine just think about choosing things that aren't going to distract you while you're talking or distract others because you're fussing with them another question i get is should i wear a pattern or just wear a solid my advice is keep it simple and wear solids why not a pattern well you're not going to control how large you are on your observer screen. So actually getting the idea through the looking glass, it's through many different perturbations of that looking glass. You might have a beautiful pattern that looks great on a 32 inch monitor when you fill up the screen. You shrink that to a two by two box and that pattern becomes confusing and hard to tell what it is. A shirt that first looked really nice in person and also looked pretty good when you had a really big image of yourself up might actually look like it was stained or spotted or simply confusing. And if the person spends the time thinking about what is that print on her shirt? Is it flowers? Is it clouds? Did she have a stain? Instead of thinking about what is she saying, you haven't accomplished your objective. Long story short, I would stick with solids and avoid patterns. One thing I will say you must avoid are any type of tight stripes or pin, pinpoint pattern because they will create an undesirable moray effect, which is also known as an interference pattern. And what happens is the camera can't distinguish the, the lines are too close together and it starts to make this interference pattern, which can actually cause a lot of distraction uh, because the shirt then appears to be sort of out of phase with itself. You can see in the image here what I mean by a moray effect, but avoid that by not using uh, these type of thin stripes. Now thick stripes can work and they are better than prints in that they are not as distracting, but they have a couple issues. One issue is they are harder to control your contrast. As you can see in this image, we have some white, some dark on that shirt. And so it's a little hard to predict if this is going to impact contrast, uh, high contrast or low contrast. And it also makes the eye flow in the direction of the stripes. And so just think about if you do in fact have stripes going in different directions or in a particular direction, is that where you want people's eyes to be directed? Because online, these things really stand out and especially because they are actually shining at you, uh, those stripes can draw a fair bit of attention. If you want an easy hack, just go on Amazon and spend $20. They sell a long sleeve button down for men and women in blue that works for basically everybody. I'm not saying you have to get this shirt, but I think that this is a good choice that works reasonably well for most people. As I mentioned earlier, if your skin tone's a bit darker, you should select a slightly darker shirt too. And of course, women shouldn't feel obligated to wear a collared shirt, although I think men generally are obligated to wear a collared shirt in an interview, but I don't think it's a bad choice. The idea here is focus on this plain blue, modest and straightforward uh, type of, of, of clothing color and texture. On the topic of texture, we also want to avoid anything shiny. It's the other thing I like about these shirts is they are a matte finish. Satin, pat uh, satin fabrics and any other type of shiny fabric can also cause some weird refractions. 
So with that said, those are all sort of some basic rules. On top of those basic rules, there are a couple, let's say, specialty items for people that wear certain things that I don't happen to wear, like glasses, lipstick, and earrings. Fortunately, Professor Bernstein was kind enough to model these, and I'm going to play a couple video clips, and let's take a look at how Professor Bernstein's on-camera impact changed based on her choices involving glasses, lipstick, and earrings. This is the first set of glasses. This is the second pair. So it's really important to test your glasses on Zoom and to test them in the actual light and lamp configuration that you're gonna use. Professor Bernstein here highlighted how different glasses will have different glare. And glare, like contrast, is a big enemy of online effectiveness. The problem that is special to glasses being glary is they interfere with the ability for the audience to see your eyes. And the eyes are the window to the soul. So we're going to want to have people see our eyes so they can make an empathetic human connection with us. And so what we're going to try to do is avoid glare on our glasses. Now you might have anti-glare glasses. That actually causes the opposite effect. Anti-glare helps you see, but it doesn't help others see you. So if you're really concerned about this, you have a couple options. One, apparently the cheapest glasses. When you decide what lipstick to wear on Zoom, you should always do a screen test before going into a meeting. Screen tests are so important because we don't always look on Zoom how we expect we're going to look. And so, as I mentioned, contrast can look very different to one's eye versus how one sees oneself on Zoom. So here, Lisa was surprised. She thought that the contrast and the pop she was going to get out of this lipstick uh, was going to be vastly different from what she actually experienced online. And so again, you want to do a screen test before you try out your makeup. I also got a comment about dark eyeliner and eyeshadow. And just like my other comment about contrast, if you have light skin and wear very dark eyeliner or eyeshadow, it will look even darker. And if you choose something that's tending toward black, it can look downright morbid and it's not going to give you the impact that you want. On a happier note, Zoom does do some smoothing and you lose some detail. So if you like to wear a cover up or blush, you actually are going to be able to get away with a thicker foundation and smooth out your appearance if that's of some concern to you. But once again, whatever you do, try it on Zoom first. When you're on Zoom, you have to be incredibly careful about your choice of earrings. In real life, these earrings are large, but not super large. Yet you see that on Zoom, they look humongous and they're uneven. You see only one and it reflects the light. Even that good old stand by the stud can cause trouble on Zoom. It can catch the light in very odd ways and it makes more of your head motions noticeable. This might seem obvious, but shiny objects are going to be high contrast by nature because they're going to draw a lot of light. They're also going to draw a lot of attention and they're going to move. We really want to avoid those type of things on Zoom. And quite frankly, there's no good reason to make that choice. 
you don't want to be remembered as that girl who had giant shiny earrings, rather that scholar who presented a fantastic paper. As a result, we want to have the focus on your eyes so you can make that empathetic connection and on your mouth so they can better understand the words you're speaking. And don't let your jewelry distract from that message. I don't think anyone notices if women don't have earrings in, so I don't even know that you have to wear them. But if you feel a need to, something small that doesn't move much and isn't particularly shiny would be a good choice. And speaking of shiny and jewelry, one of the worst choices you can make are any type of metal bracelet. Metal bracelets tend to bang and clang, and if you have a jangly bangle, there's a good chance that you're going to distract I often get asked, should I wear my hair up or down? And I think the answer is it depends on you and how you want to present. But in general, hair up has a couple issues on Zoom. As I mentioned, the resolution's not great. And so if you have your hair up, as my wife is demonstrating in the lower picture here, you might kind of look like you have a helmet on. It creates a bit of an odd effect and you can't exactly tell what is going on, whether that's a bun. We just don't have the level of detail. With her hair down, she looks normal. In fact, beautiful. She happens to have lovely hair. And so that's another reason to choose it. It's a feature that I think complements her well. But we might make a different choice, both your listener and in a different environment. My wife is a scientist. And so if she was at a lab with her hair down, it actually looks kind of out of place. Whereas when she has her lab glasses and her hair up and her white shirt in a lab setting, she looks really fitting there. On the other hand, if you are recording from your messy bedroom, and let's talk about that later because that may not be your best bet anyway, having your hair up and an expensive string of pearls uh, as a necklace may actually make you look over overdressed for your context and out of place. In my limited experience at three different law schools, most female law professors uh, wear their hair down Male law professors who have longer hair, I do see that in a bun from time to time or down. I think that you can wear your hair down, whether you are male or female in an interview, especially on Zoom. Uh, but I would again play test this and make sure that it works for the attitude you're trying to present. It can come off uh, if you have your hair up as a little stiffer. You may want to be a little more approachable uh, by making a different choice. But again, that's up to you. Just think about how it looks and how much you can tell uh, what, what exactly that hair is doing. And in fact, the camera itself. And one last word about this, because I hope that I haven't given you the wrong impression that you have to look perfect. We're all going to do our very best to look as good as we can on these interviews. And that's it. We don't need to apologize for not being perfect. Until recently, you couldn't even get a haircut. I had a beard down to my, you know, first button on my shirt. And what am I going to do about it? So one thing that has been coming up in the literature is this new appearance apology. For example, someone might say, I'm sorry my hair is shaggy. I couldn't get to the barber. Or I'm sorry I have these bags under my eyes. Taking care of the kids all day is killing me. Don't make these remarks. They don't help you. They may devalue your status. And they may draw attention to problems that don't actually exist. They don't wipe away the problem. So drawing attention to it is not necessarily helpful. If you are in a rush and you get to your interview a bit late, that's not great. But don't draw further attention to it by making a comment about it. And again, we'll come back to the idea of being prepared mentally uh, for, for your meeting as well at the end of this. And just a side note, if you were are an, if you are in an organization in which people are presenting online and you hear someone on your team make this kind of apology, I'd really ask you to think about changing the tone and letting them know that you appreciate that they're there and it's acceptable for them to be there and not necessarily in the exact same way that they would in person and compliment them for their amazing performance. I think we need to try to change this appearance apology culture and, uh, and as a result, uh, just something for us all to think about. The Zoom camera is trained. Moving on from our own appearance, let's talk about the appearance of our environment and how that affects us and our effectiveness. Three topics to cover here are lights, camera, and avoiding distractions. To focus on whoever is speaking. 
your lighting makes a huge difference. And so here, our main rule of thumb, avoid being backlit. Avoid being backlit. Avoid being backlit. I know it's nice to work by a window, but recording with your back to a window is the worst place in the room you can be doing this from. Look at the difference between just closing the blinds. On the left, we have an individual who is like severely backlit. And what's the effect that you get? It's flattened, it's two dimensional, it's hard to make out facial expressions, I can't see or read the lips, I can't see or make contact with the eyes, I can't tell what's going on with those earrings or that hairdo, the prints, you know, everything, it's confusing and it's an unhelpful image. Simply closing the blind and adding front lighting helped a great deal, but it didn't necessarily give us the best possible image. And it can, even with additional lighting, it can be impossible to get good daytime lighting if your desk is in front of a window. And as a result, you might have to put so much light towards you that you either get glare or deep shadows or other types of distractions. So what do you do if your back is to the window? Inadvertently focus. Well, you could turn around and sit on the different side of your desk. You might have to re relocate your furniture for an interview of this importance, or for that matter, you can just put on a webcam. The ideal would be recording from the middle of a well-lit room, not so close to the wall that you draw a shadow on the wall, not so close to the window that you have very irregular lighting, but your ideal spot will be toward the middle of that room to get that nice balanced lighting so you don't have, guess what, high contrast. We don't want high contrast, we don't want bright brights and dark darks, but an even tone and even lighting, much easier accomplished when your back is not to a window. It's on you when you move. I wanna talk about camera height because this is another public service announcement. I have spent more time in the last six months staring up people's noses than I ever cared to in my entire life. And so I would like us all to think about how our laptops have given us nostril vision. Effectively, the way that we communicate on Zoom with our laptops is we open it on our desk, we fold it to about 45 degrees so we're in the frame, and we effectively stand over it. And what's the effect that this gives? Well, first off, it emphasizes features that you may not want to emphasize, most notably one's neck. The neck is not necessarily a feature we all want to emphasize, but hey, if you've got a lovely neck, go with it. The second thing is that we now are forced to look down at somebody and looking down on someone is not going to ingratiate us to a room full of scholars where we're hoping to get a job. It can come off as certainly less than humble, even if you don't intend it, because we are literally looking down our nose at our audience. And of course they are looking up it. The solution is get that camera at eye level. The best way to do this is a webcam, or as I mentioned at the beginning, you can, if you need to in a pinch, use your camera or your, um, sorry, you can use your smartphone or you can use your tablet or you can use a DLSR camera in, in a pinch. The webcam is going to be the easiest solution uh, to, to those problems. Around, just you also want to avoid getting the camera too far away and too high because you're only going to be two inches by two inches of real estate on their screen. So if your camera is too high and far away, you're a tiny little speck, harder to identify with, and quite frankly, less impressive. We have the exact same individual with two different camera angles. One was simply zoomed and cropped versus the other one. And what's the difference? Well, one of them, we really look at the person. The other one, we're seeing mostly empty space. So although I think it's less of a crime than the nostril vision problem, having your camera too high and too far away can also be a negative. We wanna get that just right because you have jangly. The way to think about getting your camera just right is to apply a videography rule called the rule of thirds. Divide the frame equally into horizontal thirds and place your eyes at the intersection among the upper two third line. This will give you a generally good uh, setup where you'll also have enough real estate that you can move a little bit and still be in frame and speak with your hands if you want to. Clothing on, or if you... To achieve this height, you may need a tripod. You can get a tripod for very cheap. They do make uh, webcams that sit directly on your monitor, but sometimes that results in it being too high. If that's the case, 
you might actually want a, a mini tripod that sits on your desk in front of the monitor and you can use that to achieve the height that you want. I've also set up uh, tripods even higher and further behind the monitor as shown in the, uh, in, in the left. The key thing is that without a tripod, you're going to have a lot more limited choices about your camera and that can be an issue. So once again, uh, having a little bit of hardware goes a long way. Put your coffee mug on the table. Let's talk about the other aspects of your setting. Many of us are not in our in ideal environment. Some of us are fortunate enough to have a home office with beautiful wood paneling and many leather bound books. Others are working from our couch or our, our dining room table or our bedrooms. Okay, and so the problem is if you are working from a table in your bedroom, as the dean of my law school does, whenever you hold a meeting, like our dean hosts our faculty meeting, she's inviting us into her bedroom. It's just a little weird, and it's probably not so great for someone who's trying to get a job. How can you avoid this if that's your only space? Well, one relatively simple solution is you can put a green screen up. A green screen is not a complicated piece of equipment. It's a piece of fabric that you can get at a fabric uh, arts and crafts store like like a Marshalls or order on Amazon for like eight or nine bucks and you can either drape it behind you off of a curtain rod or a shower rod or you can buy something to hang it up on but with a couple of alligator clips and a curtain rod you should be able to uh, uh, change your entire environment and change that background. Now some of you are saying, well I don't need to do that, I'll just use the virtual background feature. The problem is that virtual background is terrible. It doesn't work well at all, especially if you have, uh, if your hands are moving in and out of frame, the fingers on your hand will spontaneously appear and disappear. I was on a call with someone and his hair kept disappearing. That was just really distracting. Once again, what do you want people to remember from your presentation? That guy whose hair kept disappearing off his head or the content of your speech. Do not use virtual backgrounds unless you have tested them extensively in all the lighting conditions you may encounter, wearing the exact clothing you plan to use and uh, over a period of time because they are spotty and irregular. I do not recommend them. And again, your best bet is just having a nice environment, but it's not always possible and so a green screen can make a less than ideal environment, much better for very, very little money and time. Table down too hard as well. One thing that you might find yourself doing if you have a swiveling chair is swiveling. And that can be extremely distracting for your viewers. Other things to watch out for is if you tend to sway as you're talking, look to the extent that my head seems to get bigger as it approaches the camera. You really want to avoid any extraneous movements because they are magnified three to four times when you're on the zoom camera. One thing that you might find yourself doing if you have a swiveling chair is swiveling. And that can be extremely distracting for your viewers. Other things to watch out for is if you tend to sway as you're talking, look to the extent that my head seems to get bigger as it approaches the camera, you really want to avoid any extraneous movements because they are magnified three to four times when you're on the zoom camera. And my last thought on setting is think carefully about where in the house you're going to be during this. We can't always control our environment, but a little bit of planning goes a long way. A little quick story. On May 6th, 2020, during Supreme Court oral argument for I think it was Barr versus American Association of Political Consultants, about 59 minutes into the scheduled hour, it sounded as if a toilet was flushing. Despite the hype that this was some sort of flush heard around the world, the lawyers and justices seemed to take no notice. The transcript didn't make a note of a toilet flush sound, and it was never determined who exactly uh, was responsible for this disruption. But it was an event so public that it turned into a media hot topic, and it definitely distracted from the thrust of the case. 
Whether the flush impacted how the case will be resolved or not is not the point. The point is that you want to design your recording setting so you don't have to deal with this type of distracting background noise. If you are on a interview, you may have to be off mute virtually all of the time, in which case you have to be very thoughtful about this. If you are able to be on mute for more of the time, remember that you can go off mute very briefly by holding down the space bar. And then when you release it, you'll go back on mute to avoid accidentally being off mute when a disruption may arise. Now look, some of us have a very, very uh, noisy household. I would recommend that you find a different space for something as high value as this interview. Can you get back into your office? Can you ask the fam to take a drive for 30 minutes while you handle this? Really try to avoid those distractions, not just for your audience, but for your own sake, because who wants to be embarrassed in the middle of something as important as your job interview because your kid flushed the toilet? And so please try to remember how your setting might affect how you're perceived and how you act and look and feel in your presentation. Once we've got all of that hardware, software, wardrobe, and setting, we're now going to work on setting up your screen and getting all the software up and running and working properly. So we're going to take an audio check, a video check, and a self check before we jump into the meeting. An audio check is really important because many of you have seen yourself on Zoom, but have probably never listened to yourself. And it actually makes a huge difference as to what your audio equipment uh, sounds like. You may not sound nearly as good as you think you do. We had a person who had AirPods, which are uh, wireless headphones, and the quality was terrible. That's the sort of thing you should evaluate for yourself using a mic test and then choose a different device. Just to give you a little preview, I want to share with you my recorded voice on four different devices, and maybe that will lead you to see why I chose a condenser microphone uh, for, for my recording. People often ask me, do I really need to get a better microphone? Well, that depends on how effective you want to be. But yes, a higher quality microphone is going to make you sound quite a bit better on the internet. The reason for this is a larger microphone will often have a larger diaphragm, which is the device that registers the vibrations in the airwaves that constitutes our voice. The larger the diaphragm, the greater its dynamic range and its better ability to pick up low sounds, high sounds, quiet sounds, and loud sounds, so you can get a much better result from a studio quality mic. That said, you might get enough bang for your buck on a more basic device built into your, your laptop. So let's take a listen and let's see what we think about these options. This audio clip was recorded using my computer's built-in microphone. This audio clip was recorded using my Logitech webcam C930E. This audio clip was recorded using my Plantronics Boom headset microphone. This audio clip was recorded using my Shure MV51 condenser microphone. So there you have it. Take a listen to yourself and decide what's best. Let's talk about our video check. We want to be engaged with our audience. We're going to do that through excellent eye contact. So we're going to get our camera set up in advance to make sure that we have the ability to make good eye contact with our audience, that we're capturing the right proportion of our body, uh, that we don't have anything extraneous in the, in the field of view, especially anything that could distract or offend somebody. And the easiest way to do that is to use the settings feature on Zoom, because if you followed my advice, you'll have the app and not be accessing this through the web, giving you the ability to do this in advance uh, from the comfort of your own home prior to your interview and getting all this uh, set up. And by the way, if there are other questions about video setup, I can take those in the Q&A 
The big point, once again, is at least give yourself a quick look and make sure that you are in frame correctly. There's nothing distracting about yourself or your environment. Best for you. I've and then make sure that you are making eye contact during your presentation. Look at the difference between these two presenters. On the left, we have an individual who is undoubtedly looking at Zoom and is watching other people speak, but it doesn't look like that's what he's doing. It rather looks like he's distracted and looking at something random and not paying attention to you, who is of course the most important thing, this lauded law professor who's watching. On the other hand, we simply move that gaze up to the camera and it appears that that person is active and engaged. So here's a little hack to make this a lot easier. I've chosen to go with the shirt. Arrange your desktop so that what you're going to be looking at is near the webcam, right? So instead of having the image of somebody else that you might be distracted by in the lower left or off to the side, put it right up next to the webcam. Whatever you're gonna be paying the most attention to, I want that to be what's near your camera. Your MV51. And that could be your, your notes if you do choose to have bullet point notes. Reading is not recommended. It's very difficult to look good reading on Zoom. In addition, your eye tracking will be different if you are actually reading it. It really does seem pretty obvious, but bullet point notes right by your camera can be a great way to get you back on track quickly while keeping your eyes on track for that content. And condense your microphone. And once you've done that, I do want you to take a moment to have that shift between being alone in your office and kind of quickly teleporting yourself into this virtual space. <sighs> Become aware of your breath. If you're running around getting everything set up, take a few breaths. Shift your mental attention from the technological aspects, they'll either work or they won't, to giving your paper and being your best self. I personally go through a little exercise where I try to have positive thoughts and I deliberately go out of my way to smile when I'm turning on the camera because I want to project that positivity and that energy. It helps me and I think it helps my audience feel energized to listen and to participate. Because I really appreciate it. And when you're ready, you turn on your webcam and you'll be good to go. So it's ability to have a... Let's review our five dimensions of online presence. First, we're going to get our hardware set up. A webcam is preferred. A smartphone will do and may do better than just a laptop. Consider a tripod. In a worst case scenario, a stack of books will do in terms of getting things higher or lower. And you can zoom with your feet. You can actually move around in order to change the frame if you don't have software that allows zooming. Speaking of software, make sure you have the latest version and quality test it before you go live. For your wardrobe, select medium colors, limit your accessories, and if you have glasses, check them carefully for glare. Try to avoid glare at all costs because it's so important for people to see your eyes. For your setting, we want to be not backlit. We don't want our backs to a window. We want to be sitting somewhere else in the room, even if we do have a blackout curtain because that natural light is actually very pleasant. We're gonna to try to get the camera at eye level and tilt it so that we are filling two thirds of the screen. And then we're going to do our final setup, doing an audio check and a video check, and last but certainly not least, a self check. Am I mentally where I need to be in order to give this talk? Why dynamic range and I hope today's webinar was helpful for you. If you still have questions and need personalized advice, I'm here to help. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching online and you can access my services through the IACCM or email me directly at seth.orenberg at gmail.com. Not too much clipping. That said, it thanks again for tuning in today. It's been my pleasure to host you for this hour. I hope this webinar was helpful and I look forward to your questions and comments about presenting your best self online. Good luck. It does cost a pretty penny, so take a listen to how you sound and decide whether or not an upgrade is something you need to do to be as effective as you wanna be. What that video briefly presented was that movement can not only be magnified, but you may not actually look the way you expect to because, especially if you have your camera at an angle, 
it's going to capture part of you as larger and smaller. So this problem of swaying and swiveling is even worse if you have not followed my advice and you're using a laptop at 45 degrees. Because as you are lording over your laptop with people staring up your nose and you staring down your nose at them, you are also potentially swaying in a manner that makes your forehead look remarkably gigantic and swift moving. So if you must use your laptop, it is even more vital that you keep yourself still while talking to avoid being a major distraction to your viewer. Well, so avoid these loud noises because you may be drawing attention to yourself and spotlighting yourself on camera exactly at the worst moment. Like, I don't know, when you reach up to your face to scratch your nose. Choose natural colors that complement how you look and avoid high contrast. As you can possibly get at Warby Parker online that are absolutely plain and have no features work the best on Zoom. On top of that, you might have to move around your lighting equipment so you don't get glare coming off your glasses. 